have you come to destroy me? I will do what I must. Then you will die. Stellaris 3.8 Gemini is set to be one of the biggest patches we've had for quite a while. There are some vast changes coming that are going to change a lot of the core systems we generally interact with. Today I'm going to go through the patch notes and let you know every change coming with patch 3.8. It's going to be quite a long video, there's quite a lot of stuff to go through, so make sure you're sat down, make sure you're comfortable, grab a beverage, grab a snack, and without any further ado, let's get in and find out what's going on. First off, we have a quick summary of all the changes coming with the Galactic Paragons DLC. So let's break those down. We have unique council roles, so these are only available if you get the DLC. These are specialized roles with specialized benefits that are part of the new council mechanics. You will get dozens of unique council roles, each based on your civic and government type. You can also unlock additional positions as your empire evolves. So throughout the game, you'll be able to get more and more councillors, up to a maximum, I believe, of six. That's the three base ones, plus three extra civics. You can recruit, improve, and follow the leaders of your empire through the ages. We are getting dynamic leaders, ladies and gentlemen. You may shape them by picking their traits, selecting their veteran classes, and guiding them towards their destiny. Up until they retire, yes, retire, retirement is now a mechanic coming in Stellaris, or perish. I'm pretty sure if they perish, there are some interesting options like state funerals and the like. You can meet the galactic heroes. Attract paragons of renown to your council. These are unique leaders with their own art, events, and stories, and may join your empire and bring their own benefits to your government. We saw a few of these in the live stream I did yesterday, which was streaming the new DLC. I'll put a link to that down in the description below if you'd like to check out all of the interesting stuff that I got to show off. You can also discover four legendary paragons with intricate event chains and unique mechanics. There are, of course, new traditions, civics, and more. A new under one rule origin that tells the tale of the leader who founded your empire. Ahem, <clears throat> God Emperor of Mankind. Eight new civics focused on leadership, from immortalizing the personalities of leaders past in digital archives, to heavily optimized council selection via corporate charter. Twelve new veteran classes, that is three classes for each of the regular leader types, so generals, scientists, admirals, and uh, governors will each have three separate veteran classes, and you can pick from one of those when you get to level four. Depending on your veteran classes, that will mean you get to unlock different types of traits as you level up further. There are, of course, hundreds of new leader traits being added with this DLC. There are two new tradition trees, one focusing entirely on new leaders, and the other one focusing very heavily on the council mechanics. On top of that, all of the regular traditions have been reworked to grant you specific new agendas. New ships, new art, and new story content. They've also introduced six new achievements. That was the paid content for Galactic Paragons. Now what about the free features we're getting with the 3.8 Gemini patch? Well, ladies and gentlemen, strap yourselves in because, oh boy, there's a lot of stuff coming. So the developers have added two new cooperative modes, allowing up to five players per empire. More information can be found on that in the previous Dev Diary 293, or one of my Dev Diary videos. I've actually got a video on that called Co-op Mode is Coming, or something like that. Cooperative PvE can be initiated from the main menu. All players that hot join the hosted game will join the primary player's empire. This mode is intended for teaching new players or for lower intensity cooperative play. Then there's co-op PvP, which can be allowed by the host of a standard multiplayer game. When enabled, empires can open themselves up to allow other players to help control their empire. They expect this game mode to be more useful for competitive team play. Important thing to note though is that co-op features are still considered to be in beta. They do still have some issues and they may be less stable than standard play, or may have some unusual experiences. They will continue to polish and refine cooperative mode over the next few patches. All praise be to the custodians. The Empire Council will also be a free feature. Ruling a galactic empire is hard work, and your council of trusty leaders is there to help you. Base game Stellaris now includes a ruling council, where up to three leaders will assist you in ruling your empire. Of course, there is your ruler, then there is your head of research, and your defense minister. Each leader gives bonuses to their area of expertise, which grow increasingly more powerful as they level up over time. 
Gestalt, on the other hand, will have a collection of immortal nodes that level up and gain new traits over time, which the developers feel better suits them thematically. Now, I do need to say here, if you're playing with Gestalt Empires, you're going to find that you're pretty much on par with regular biological empires in this mode. However, in the paid features, those regular empires get access to special council traits for their leaders, which can be stacked to do crazy things. I'm looking at you, minus 90% ship build cost, you're just mad. They've added a ruler creator, which is a new step in the empire creation screen that permits the selection of your ruler's appearance and starting traits. You also get to select whether they are a governor, an admiral, a researcher, a scientist, or a general. Or at least that's what they used to be before they became your ruler. The developers have also updated several leaders to use the new leader system. That means they've updated Tuberek with new effects of the Paragon system. They've updated Reth on Doll with new visuals and effects to use the Paragon system. They've updated Gray's menu and effects, you guessed it, to use the Paragon system. They've updated Caretaker. They've updated S875.1 Warform, and they've updated the Oracle. These all have new visuals and new effects that come from the Paragon system. This is fantastic. This means that even the older leaders we used to find in the galaxy will still now now be renowned leaders in the base game. Then there are the ground combat and bombardment changes. We've had some system reworks. The core part of ground combat hasn't really changed. We still have those circles attacking other circles, so that's still the same, but we've got a whole host of other changes that have come in. So there's now an army builder tab that's been added to star bases, which allow for an easier creation of assault armies or just any attacking army across a sector. An army can then be set as a rally point and new troops will automatically try to merge with this fleet regardless of whether they were queued with the army builder or the old recruit button from planets. Planets can now select whether or not to deploy and orbit any newly recruited armies. This means that if you are on a planet that's under bombardment or there's an enemy in the system and you don't want your armies to jump into orbit and die, you can now force them to spawn on the planet. That is really good. Planets can now be taken through orbital bombardment if all defending troops have been killed. A policy can be set if you wish to refuse this form of surrender, and planets will not surrender to genocidal opponents. For example, if you're a regular bio-empire and you're attacking a hive mind, the hive mind will never surrender because their pops will normally be purged, and they don't want that. Interestingly though, this means you never actually have to build another army in Stellaris again if you don't want to. Bombardment is significantly more damaging than it used to be. More pops will die, and more buildings and districts will be ruined. Orbital Bombardment will now scale with the amount of ships bombarding. The first fleet size ships will do full damage. After that, each additional 100 fleet size will add 70% of that efficiency. For example, 300 fleet capacity worth of ships will deal 100% uh, plus 70% plus 70% plus 70 squared, which is 49%, for a total of 219% worth of bombardment damage. This means, though, that there is an upper limit to the total. I think it was 333. I did the math before. I'm not looking it up now. But basically, you're going to get diminishing returns the larger your fleet size when you're bombarding. Bombardment effects are scaled based on the number of pops, buildings, and planet size. Small, dense planets will suffer greater losses than large, sparsely populated planets. Ground combat is also more devastating to planets than it used to be, but much less so than bombarding. The effects of collateral damage from different army types have also been adjusted. Previously, the collateral damage on army types was a linear value and not a multiplier, which meant that in practice, high damage, high collateral units like Xenomorphs could effectively do less collateral damage on the planet compared to normal troops because they would kill the enemy troops very quickly. This is no longer the case as Collateral Damage Modifier now acts as a multiplier on any damage dealt. Planetary Capital Buildings will also spawn defensive armies for free based on the tier of the building. 0, 4, 8, and 16, depending on whether you're a basic colony, the first level of colony building, the first level of administration building, level 2, or the top level, the Empire Capital. This is also great if you're taking the unyielding tradition because now you're going to be getting extra unity for doing absolutely nothing from all of your planetary capitals. Overall, all of these changes sound really, really good. I'm very excited to get to play with them. 
The fabled sector editor from ages past has returned. It is now possible to edit sectors in the planet and sector screen. Systems can be freely moved between sectors as long as they are in range of the sector capital. Sector capitals must now be at least four jumps away from any other. This basically means all of the finickety micromanaging you used to have to do with sectors is a thing of the past. It does, however, mean that you will be pretty much unable to release one sector vassals next to your capital right from the start of the game. You will have to expand a bit further than four jumps away. We're also getting a customizable menu, meaning it is now possible to rearrange the list of options on the left side of the menu by pressing the new cog icon at the top. This will also correspondingly change the hotkeys to open this menu, allowing you to rebind these menu items to whichever of the F1 to F10 keys you prefer to have them on. This is a massive quality of life improvement. I wish they could go further with this and change all key rebinds, but as far as I know, there are some limitations to what they're actually able to achieve. So doing something like this for us is definitely a plus. And if you're enjoying this video, please rebind that like button. We're also now able to customize the message notification and toast notifications we're going to be getting in game. Messages and notifications can be customized to suit your needs. They've added a new message type called a toast, which pops up on the right hand side and disappears automatically after a brief period of time. They've also got settings messages, control plus click or cogs on certain messages, allowing you to open the message settings menu. And from that menu, you can change what you see and how you see it in the top of your screen. Messages can be entirely disabled, enabled or set to automatically pause the game depending on what the message is about. The fleet and ship designer has been changed. It has been merged into two tabs on the same screen. It now displays a longer list of fleets and we have two new features. The copy fleet template and the overwrite fleet template are now in there. Also, using delete plus enter will now delete a fleet. That will be particularly useful if we have lots of empty fleets or fleets with just a single ship or something like that. We also have another new feature and that is science ship automation. We've had that before, but now it's been changed. You can now enable or disable more automation modules on your science ship. That means you can choose any number of these next five options and your science ship will automatically do them. You can choose to explore systems, which will cause your ships to explore the galaxy by entering systems and discover any planets and high planes in there. This means if you want to explore the galaxy quickly without surveying every system you come across, you can turn just this on and your ships will go out and find all the other empires, all the weird stuff out there. You can also set it to survey systems. This means it will survey new systems the science ship enters. If you turn off explore systems and just turn on survey systems, you will of course only survey systems you've already explored. You can set it to investigate anomalies, meaning they will research any anomalies you've discovered. You can choose to excavate archaeology sites, meaning the scientists will automatically go around and excavate any archaeology sites in your empire. And you can set it to research special projects. This is particularly useful in a war. You can move a science ship right up to the war front, turn on research special projects, and not worry about having to right click on all of the scrap that comes up because that science ship will do it automatically. This is such a quality of life improvement. And my hat goes off to Paradox Arctic and in particular the developer Ofe up there who spearheaded this change. What about improvements to the game? There have of course been quite a few of those in the new patch. They've added new capital designations for non guest out empires. That is factory capital, forge capital, trade capital and extraction capital. The most exciting of these two are the factory and forge capitals because they will shift your jobs over on your industrial districts into just metallurgist jobs or just consumer goods jobs depending on which of these you select. So it is now viable to have your capital as a forge world and that is really cool. They've added unique textures for Mercury, Venus, Neptune and Uranus for the Sol system so it is more accurate to what these planets look like in real life. That's a great immersion feature. They've added unique textures for Earth and Mars when terraformed based off of available height map data. So if you terraform those worlds, they will still look correct. You'll still have the outline of the continents. 
They've improved the animation for gas giants. They've added a new anomaly to find called the orb. They've added a special solar system protected by the Lone Defender. I saw that yesterday in my live stream. Unfortunately, I didn't manage to get there in time, but it was an interesting one. They've added a decision to clear the wreckage on a broken Shackles starting planet in the event that they are conquered before they enact the Memorial to the Unshackled decision. This is helpful if you're a conquest-based empire and you want to kill some broken Shackles people. They've improved the accuracy of tooltips on the galaxy setting screen and implemented experimental nested tooltip functionality. The mind-wiped species from the On the Shoulders of Giants will now have the forcefully devolved trait, which is very thematic. There is a 1% chance that a pre-FTL civilization will spawn with the forcefully devolved trait. That's also quite cool. They've added the hotkey U to upgrade your fleets. That's a quality of life improvement. The Broken Shackles Empires will now have their starting Minister of Defense and Head of Research be recruited from any of the species in their empire rather than just your primary species. They've added keyboard commands for jumping to the next day. They've added ship section templates to the ship designer. Wait a minute, let me just go back to that one, sorry. They've added a keyboard command for jumping to the next day, meaning if you want to just do a one day tick, you press the, uh, the full stop button, the period button on your keyboard, and you will do just a single day rather than having to quickly pause and unpause. That's awesome. So back again, they've added ship section templates to the ship designer, which allows for easier creation of designs of a certain role, such as carriers or missile focus designs. Auto designed ships and those designed by the ship dis roll button will now only equip Archeo components if your empire has the Archeo engineer's ascension perk. That will be very useful to empires who and players who like to use the auto design feature, but have been crippled by the fact that suddenly all of their ships require minor artifacts and they simply don't have any. Also, you can now hot join a multiplayer game to control the demonic incursion. Mic drop. We're now getting so many improvements and features coming with 3.8 that people have been asking for for a long time, and it feels really, really good. What is your favorite new feature coming with the free patch? Let me know down in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. So there are also balance changes coming, of course. The Carnate Successor Origin now unlocks the Raiding Bombardment stance. Fallen Empire starting rulers will now all be level 10. Species traits that gave plus N leader level cap now give reduced leader upkeep and reduced maximum leader negative traits. That is, I think, good, but, um, but in some ways, yeah, no, I think that's mainly good because that should make that trait much more usable, especially early on in the start of the game. And then that maximum leader negative trait bonus becomes very helpful later on when your leaders are higher levels. Because the way leaders work now is they have a secret number of negative traits they will get as they level up. And if you reduce the maximum number of negative traits available to them, this keeps your rulers better and healthier for longer. They've reduced the focus capital production bonus from plus 20% to plus 15% following dev diary feedback. Random leader starting age range increased to 25 to 35. Bonuses for many authorities has also changed. Previous benefits such as the old form of agendas and mandates have been removed. So we have a rework to how government authorities work. Let's go through them. Democracies focus on their factions. You'll get plus 10% faction approval, which is amazing, and they reset government reform and policy cooldowns following elections. Their ruler provides plus 2% faction unity and plus 5 edict fund per level. The people have spoken. Oligarchies focus on their ruling council, and you get plus 2 effective councillor skill. This is really good because it means you can actually go beyond level 10 in the skills of your councillor with regards to the bonus they provide with their council role. So the ruler for an oligarchy provides plus 5% councillor experience gain and plus 5 edicts fund per level. And this also means that oligarchies can get that up to an effective level of 12 for a total of 60% experience gain and 60 edict fund. Dictatorships focus on their ruler. Their ruler provides a whopping minus 2% pop amenities usage and plus 10 edict fund per level. So at level 5, you're sitting pretty with 50 edict fund and minus 10% pop amenities usage. That's really good. Imperial empires focus on their capital system. This means you get plus 10% resources from jobs on your capital, which is amazing to start the game with, and your ruler provides plus 0.25 maximum influence from power projection per level and plus 5 edict fund per level. Megacorps have plus 20% commercial pact efficiency, making all commercial packs better for Megacorps. And if you're a Megacorp player, that definitely sounds like a good thing. 
plus 50% Empire Size from Planets is now the new effect. They've got rid of the old Empire Size modifier and now it's just Empire Size from Planets, which is a minimal effect or minimal addition to your Empire Size anyway, and this definitely makes Mega Corps better than they were previously. Your ruler will give you plus 2% branch office value and plus 5 edict fund per level. For hive minds, you still get the standard 25% pop growth speed and minus 25% empire size effect, and your rulers grant 2% monthly unity and 5 edict fund per level. Machine intelligences have plus 1 pops when establishing colonies, same as before, plus 1 mechanical pop assembly, and now plus 10% mining station output, in addition to the regular plus 50% empire size from planets, and of course the multiplicative negative modifier of a 50% pop growth reduction for all of your regular bio pop growth. That does make sense, you are a machine focused empire. Your ruler grants minus 3% empire size from pops and plus 5 edict fund per level. So at level 10 you're looking at minus 30% empire size. I think we can stack this with other modifiers and get to a total empire size reduction of 100%, meaning your empire is at size 0, and thus you have finally defeated empire size once and for all, ladies and gentlemen. We're back to having bureaucrats, kind of, and you no longer have to worry about those negative modifiers for having gone over your empire size capacity. They've also fiddled around with the minor artifact storage capacity. It's been lowered to 2000, which does sound bad, but the Faculty of Archaeo Studies increases this by an additional 2000 for a total of 4, which is higher than the previous 3000, and it goes up by 4500 if you have the Archaeo Engineer's Ascension perk, for a total capacity of 6500 minor artifacts. That's a lot better than it used to be, but I would personally still like to see it higher. Criminal syndicates now have minus 20% to branch office cost. This should somewhat help for the fact that your branch offices keep getting closed willy nilly. And that should make criminal syndicates better to play than ever before. Broken Shackles laborer jobs no longer benefit from modifiers applying to artisans or metallurgists. This is a nerf to Broken Shackles and it's kind of a shame. Scavengers of Broken Shackles are now considered researchers for the purposes of modifiers so they do benefit from bonuses and that's definitely a plus. The Grand Herald, which is an excavation site you can go through to get a titan called the Grand Herald, now uses Archaeotech components. I love that, that's a nice thematic change, and actually that might make it more powerful than it previously was. They've rebalanced the Shroud Touch traits that can be gained by leaders going through a Shroud Tunnel. Commercial packs now give high economic intel on colonies, and empires with the payback origin gain a damage bonus against ships belonging to militarily superior empires. So that was already the case. Possibly it wasn't actually implemented correctly and we weren't getting that bonus. That might be what I'm hearing here. The Seize the Galatron Cassus Belli is now unlocked the first time the Galatron is used instead of upon acquisition. So if you get the Galatron, you don't have to worry about anyone fighting you to take it if you don't use it. Trade Collection will now prioritize the capital and then sector capitals if they're in range, even if other star bases are closer, resulting in overall greatly reduced piracy from trade routes if collection is there. Curator Orders now offer guest outs a trait instead of a scientist. That's quite fun. They've changed the Technocracy bonus to award scientists a random expertise in addition to other traits. Now that's, that's good because they have changed the way that scientists works. We no longer have scientists de dedicated to each of the three research types. Instead we just have a single director of research. So this is nice that they've, they've changed this around. It would not be a major Solaris update without some changes to the AI in game. And of course we're getting quite a few. They've massively reduced the number of star bases assigned to cloaking detection for AI. This is a rebalance change that they've needed after First Contact was released because the AI was definitely setting up too much cloaking detection. It meant that they were getting excess cloaking detection which wasn't necessary and also it could be a bit punitive for the player when you were trying to use your cloaks. It did kind of feel bad. Fanatic spiritualists will now always outlaw robotic workers. AI attitude updates now happen only monthly and on diplomatic actions rather than how it used to be previously. They've relaxed AI budget requirements for orbital ring upgrades so it should happen more frequently. The AI is allowed to build economically useful orbital ring buildings without a matching designation. That's pretty cool. The AI takes into account planetary production impact of possible orbital ring buildings when considering building orbital rings. 
They stopped the AI from never fully reevaluating ship designs if it had no preferences specified in its AI personality. This was probably leading to crap ships from the AI, even if they got better technology. The AI is now much more restrictive about building gene clinics, and it means that every planet you take over from an AI empire will not be chock-a-block with gene clinics. Thank goodness. The AI will now prioritize building new star bases at the sector capital more than other places. It will also micromanage their enforcer jobs by using the scripted logic provided by the planetary automation system. This makes sense as a, uh, this makes sense as a change, honestly. I don't see why it wasn't doing that, and it's good that they've now included that, given that somebody actually worked on a good scripting system for our planetary automation. It's good they're pass passing that change over as well. They fixed an issue where AIs would not attack pirate stations in their empire, and the AI will now resettle pops with low habitability to planets with higher habitability in the early game, meaning you should have, when you take over a planet, not any planets full of the wrong habitability pops that the AI has decided to put down there for goodness only knows why. They've adjusted AI alloy spending to be a bit better at spending alloys on star bases and colony ships at the same time. I've actually noticed the AI sometimes overspends on colony ships a little bit, and this can leave them a little bit weak in the early game. At least that was my experience yesterday when I played the current new patch 3.8. I actually managed to kill an AI empire that had definitely overspent on colonies. It was a it was a, uh, a machine empire that had just grabbed like four or five new colonies rather than spending those two or three thousand alloys on new ships. Had they bought the ships, I probably wouldn't have been able to kill them so easily. They fixed several issues where the AI would build or upgrade amenity or crime buildings even when they had already forbidden jobs from those buildings. The AI trader personas are now the only ones who will build trade hub star bases, and they will now only build them in sector capitals. They've improved peacetime AI for upgrading fleets and patrolling trade routes, and AI empires that have the thrifty perk on their main species are now also eligible for the peaceful traders and ruthless capitalist AI personalities. And that's a pretty cool change that should have some thematic impact on the games we play in terms of what the AI is doing and who they claim to be. They've made a stability change that actually does somewhat impact me and makes screen clipping a little bit more difficult, and that is tooltips will no longer be shown when the game has lost focus, i.e. tabbed out or any other focus loss. This should prevent crashes caused by tooltips being generated in contexts when they aren't expected. This, um, yeah, this makes it harder to clip things in game because you have to actually take a screen, a print screen, rather than being able to use the regular clipping tool if you're trying to get a tooltip up but otherwise it's, it's, it's probably a good change if it helps with stability overall. Wow, this has been a lot of changes. We're now over 27 minutes through this dev diary video, this uh, patch notes video. This is actually the secret call out. If you're still watching and you're still engaged and paying attention at this point, I'd love to hear from you. Let me know down in the comments below. This, this is the secret call out. Anyway, let's move on. We're gonna now move on to the UI changes. So they have disabled the tutorial in multiplayer, meaning you can't get that free plus two alloys or whatever it was, uh, but they haven't disabled it in co-op PVE. That's probably a good change overall. The game will now auto-close, auto-opened anomaly windows if the science ship has already started researching the anomaly. DLC icons on the Empire creation screen now appear in the same size and in order of releases. That's, that's a nice change to see. The pop-up window when you are kicked or banned or the server is lost will now appear in front of other windows so you can actually see it. They've truncated long Empire government and species names in Hotjoin. They've made scrolling smoother in some places. The display special project energy cost is now in the situation log. The auto track log entry setting is saved in the save game as well, that's good. They fix certain windows, for example, ship orders being too small compared to the sprite tiling, which caused graphical bugs. They've removed the in-game web browser. The game will now use the system browser instead. They'll adjust chat input and chat entry to the new chat window size. And they've changed player ready string to text icons. Finally, the planet view no longer closes when opening other UIs like the pop resettlement or market view. This should actually be really helpful if you need to go back to your planet after you've done some resettling. I'm not going to read all of the bug fixes that are included here because there's quite a few. I am, however, going to talk about some that I think are rather good and important to hear about. First and foremost amongst them, they removed broken shackles being scripted to start without a shipyard. Now, you will actually get a shipyard at the start of the game as broken shackles. Apparently that was a bug, but it was definitely a bit annoying. 
choosing to hand over system ownership during the course of pre-FTL observation event Among Us will now correctly grant you a claim on that system if you choose to give it up. You can no longer become a fanatic purifier while you are the galactic custodian or galactic emperor. That's a shame because it was possible to do that if you were taking the Fear of the Dark Origin. I thought it was quite hilarious and thematic, but no longer can you do that. A big one here, they fixed the status quo in subsidiary wars, subjugating the wrong empire. This was a big issue because basically with a subsidiary war, you could end up status quoing and someone else would get sub subjugated, possibly even you would get subjugated the wrong way around. I actually can't remember how it went, but it was gosh darn awful. And your ring world will now use your empire color. That is a fantastic change. I'm very happy to see it's a nice little little tiny thing that's kind of imperceptible but now we're actually going to get colored ring worlds that look like the, the same way our ships use our empire color there's also a slew of modding changes i won't go through all of those because the majority of my audience are not modders but if you want to check those out i'll put a link to the uh patch notes in the description and you can pop over and read through all of the different modding changes that will be coming with 3.8 Otherwise, there's just a few hours now until 3.8 releases. I will be doing a live stream. I'm actually streaming Stellaris Galactic Paragon's multiplayer Cold War event. That's going to be a lot of fun. Join me live a little later on this evening, or if you're watching this video after the patch is released and the live stream is finished, you can check out that live stream by heading over to my channel and going to the lives page to see how it all went down. I'll also be giving away a number of Stellaris Galactic Paragon keys if you are in the audience, and you're watching the stream. So if you want a free key, head on over and check it out. If you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to know more about the new God Emperor Origin, that is the 40K God Emperor coming to Stellaris with patch 3.8, as well as the new civics and traditions, click the video on screen now.